Hi everyone, my name is Lauren. I am on Team Oye, and today's training is going to cover how to build an escape room experience in Oye. Um, we've gotten a lot of requests from some of you who have wanted to build these on your own. You may have experienced one um, that the Oye team has built because we've built a couple of them in the past. Um, and so today I'm gonna actually walk you through the first escape room that I ever built, uh, which was last last holiday season, last December, um, and it was based on the movie Home Alone. Um, so first I'm gonna start off by just telling you some best practices and helpful tips for when you build an escape room. Um, if you were in the, the live training of this, you heard me say this, that I, I truly believe that coming up with the ideas, the puzzles, the logic behind the escape room is actually harder than I think than building the escape room in Oye itself, right? So whenever you're thinking about sort of how to build out those puzzles, um, you know, you wanna make sure just, and it sounds very simple, but I, just, just to reiterate, um, you wanna make sure that everything makes as much sense as possible, right? And how do you find out whether or not something makes sense? How do you find out whether it's gonna be clear? Um, get a sample group. Right. So if you think that you have some great ideas um, for your escape room and you want to build it out in OEA, we definitely recommend getting some test people in there. Um, you can even, you know, shoot us an email team at OEA.co. Email us. We're happy to sort of run it through with you and just make sure. Right. Because just because something makes total sense to you doesn't necessarily mean that everybody else is going to get it. Uh, I learned this definitely when building my escape room. The first group that I took through this one had uh, had some comments and some questions. And then even whenever we ran through the experience, with um, the actual groups, right, that some of the people who really experienced this escape room, there was still some stuff that didn't quite land. And so during the training today, I am going to walk you through sort of in this room, what worked and what didn't. Um, I hope to also give you some ideas, right, of like the different ways that you can build the escape rooms um, and sort of some of the ways that you can build puzzles in OEA. One thing that I would say is that um, anywhere between four and six puzzles or sort of different rooms, different problems to solve is going to be a pretty decent experience, right? It, it usually ran for about 30 minutes. Um, so anywhere between four and six rooms will likely give you about a 30 minute experience. Obviously, that depends on how hard you make it, um, on, on who's doing it, right? But that is pretty standard and, and across um, most all of the groups that I ran this escape room with and that we've we've seen whenever we've run different escape room experiences for other teams, um, that's about average, is about about 30 minutes. Um, but but yeah, so the way that I'm gonna run this training video is that I'm going to alternate between director mode and editor mode. And that's gonna be to show you first in each room the way that the viewer sees the escape room. And then once I sort of explain how the viewer saw it, and I'm also gonna tell you some comments, you know, what people said, what maybe wasn't clear versus what was immediately understood, then we'll go into editor mode in each room and sort of unpack how it was all built, sort of deconstruct it. Um, I think there's gonna be a lot of things in here that maybe um, a lot of features that you maybe haven't seen before or didn't know could be used in that way. And so definitely wanna encourage you to, when building escape rooms, really, really take full advantage of all of the different features um, that we have in OEA Studio because there, there's a whole lot of fun stuff in here. So that being said, let's get started. Um, like I said, this escape room was inspired by Home Alone, which is personally my favorite Christmas movie. So when thinking about how to build this escape room, right, the first thing I did was think, um, you know, what was the goal, right? What's the goal of the escape room? Theoretically, right, it's to get out of something. Um, and so for this particular experience, I wanted, to, I wanted it to stay really true to the movie, and if you've seen Home Alone, you know that um, Kevin is a prankster, right? Kevin McAllister is an eight-year-old boy who gets stuck home alone, um, and he feels threatened by a couple of burglars who he overhears are planning to rob his home, right? But luckily, Kevin is, he's a prankster, he's a trickster, and so what Kevin does is he sets traps throughout the house um, to sort of deter the burglars from catching him. And so in this escape room, the goal in each room is to in some way defend the room, right, to set the trap. So the first thing I did was I built this sort of intro room. Um, I won't play the music in this experience because it's a little bit distracting, but I did have the Home Alone score playing, right, really taking people into the experience, making them feel, um, you know, as immersed in it as possible. This shot is the exterior of the McAllister home in Chicago from the movie. And so, um, you know, this is what I chose for my entry page. And when everybody was in here, I had this button down here to show my welcome text, right? So this was some introductory text uh, to sort of explain what the goal of the escape room was, right? So your family has left for Christmas in Paris, but they left you home alone. You've overheard a couple of scary looking burglars plan to rob your home tonight. You need to find a way to defend each room or Harry and Marv might find their way to you, right? So now you know the goal of the escape room. 
And then I had a couple of different options here. So you'll notice on the room list, there's actually three sets of each room. So each of these, right, sitting room, buzzes room, you'll notice there's a one, a two, and a three. That's because when I was running this experience, I had three preset groups. So I went ahead and I tagged everybody. And then I sent team one to sitting room one, team two to sitting room two, team three to sitting room three. So I'll quickly just show you how I do that. So for this button, right, if you open up the config, that was how that was set up. Okay, and then for another experience, right, um, I did, um, I, I sent people randomly off. And so in order to do that, what I did was if you open up this config, I set a target group size of six, I set it to temporary, right, and cloning of sitting room one. Okay, and so what that basically did is when I hit this button, it sent, it split everybody up into teams of six, and it sent them all into clones of sitting room one, right? And then from there, each button that linked to the next room was also set up similarly, clones of that room, right? Rather than the fixed rooms that are in here. One important note just before we get started that you're going to see um, escape rooms in general are built almost entirely using a visible for condition feature that we're going to talk about today. So that just means that in order to get to the next room, you had to click the arrow, right? In each room, there's going to be an arrow that appears. And each arrow in each room is set to have a visible for condition sort of like action builder, right? So you have to do X, Y, and Z in the room in order to show the arrow. And that is how you get to the next room. And the arrow in each room is a button, right? It's a breakout button that will take you then to the next room. And that's so that you can configure by either just sending them to a fixed room, right? In the sitting room, the arrow links to Buzz's room. Or um, if you're just randomizing them, then uh, th they would be to temporary rooms, temporary copies, right? The button in the sitting room would link to a temporary copy of Buzz's room. The button in Buzz's room would link to a temporary copy of the creepy basement and so on and so forth. And so we'll explain that as we go in. Okay, so let's go ahead and enter the escape room in sitting room one. It's the first room of the escape room. Okay, so the text here says, you need to be sure no one can get through the windows, but that will require setting the alarm. If only you could remember the numbers to the combination that mom made. Okay, so as you can see, we've got these text boxes up here, right? They're all clickable. The goal is to figure out the numbers that unlock this code, right? And so that's how you set the alarm, right? Then what I did is I had some helper text appear, right? So I'd show this text. Okay, these stockings sure do make you miss your siblings. What are their names again? Okay, so I'll tell you right off the bat, this was the most confusing room for the attendees across the board that entered my escape room. Okay, I would go so far as to say almost this one didn't really work. Um, and it, it's because it was a little bit too complicated. There were almost too many steps in this in order to get um, to the text to figure out like what, what was gonna go into the text boxes. So the first things first, right? When I alluded to the stockings, it made people think that there was text written on the stockings, right? And there's not. This is really just a still from the movie. Um, so what I should have done was I should have um, probably written the names of the family members on the stocking. So I'll stop right here and go ahead and tell you what the answer to this room is, right? How to solve this room. So the McAllister siblings, if you remember from the movie, if you've seen it, um, the, you know, there's five of them. There's five McAllister children, right? There's Buzz, Megan, Linny, Jeff, and Kevin. Okay, that's why there's five text boxes. And you see there's five stockings here. So theoretically, I'm sure their names are actually on these stockings. Um, whether they're in age order, I'm not sure. But what I wanted the, you know, what I wanted these attendees to do was to figure out how to make the the um the letters right from the from the kids names into numbers right and that's something that we've used in escape rooms in the past and it makes sense right because there's a couple different ways to do this once they figured out um that you know the names of the five siblings which if it, i did get this question during the training it is very common to have escape rooms where people have to google things right sometimes they can solve it all on their own within the room um, but we've definitely had things where people have to like google to translate languages or to convert letters to numbers to look up a certain song things like that so that's totally normal and that was expected in this room right so once they had googled they found out the names of the McAllister siblings they find out there's five of them maybe then that sort of clicks in their head right okay how do i get the numbers how do I convert uh, letters right into numbers? And there's a couple different ways that, that could be, right? Buzz, B-U-Z-Z, -Z, right, has four letters. So theoretically, this one could be four. And then you have Megan, M-E-G-A-N, that could be five, 
right? But that was not the case here, right? What I wanted them to do was I wanted them to correspond the first letter in each kid's name to the order that it falls in the alphabet, right? So instead of, you know, there, instead of this number being four, right, I wanted it to be two because buzz B is the second letter in the alphabet, right? So what I wanted this to be, right, was Megan, M, that's the 13th letter in the alphabet. Linny, that's L, that's the 12th. Jeff is 10. And Kevin, that's K, that's 11. Okay, you'll notice that now that I've put these numbers correctly into the boxes, this arrow has just appeared to allow me to go to the next room. Okay, so that's the answer, right? But once again, this didn't really work. I think what the solve here would have been, um, would have been to first of all, put their names, right? In small text, maybe some nice cursive text, put them on the stockings, right? And sort of help them understand, oh, okay, there's five names on these stockings. There's five text boxes here. That maybe makes some more sense. But I think unfortunately there was just too much work to even get there because they were confused about why I alluded to the names of the, of, of, you know, the siblings in the text, but then you couldn't find the names on the stockings. And then from there, there was some confusion about, well, you know, how do we translate the letters into the numbers? I think just to make it even simpler for them, um, you know, it, it would be good to sort of eliminate one of those steps and to maybe even give them an extra hint, right? Something about how they have to be in alphabetical order. Another question I did get um, a couple of times actually while running the escape room, which I personally didn't think about and didn't see as an issue. But again, this is why you test it. This is why you double check everything and think everything through. Um, I got the question, does the code have to be numerical, right? And that seemed really obvious to me because I thought, well, all alarm codes are numerical, but maybe they're not, right? And maybe somebody has had an experience with some with an alarm code that can, um, that can use letters, right? And so I did have a group that tried, you know, B, M, L, J, they were using the right things, um, but they didn't necessarily, it wasn't necessarily clear that it had to be uh, numbers here, right? And so depending on how hard, again, you want this experience to be, maybe that's fine. And maybe you just let them keep cracking at it until they can get to it. But to mitigate frustration and just to sort of make it a super pleasant experience, I do recommend just thinking through every single step of logic that they will have to get in order to unlock the door, right? In order to get that arrow. So now that we've seen this, let's go ahead and go into editor mode. I'll show you how this was built. So these here are just simple text boxes, right? This is all that is, right? But in order to make it, right, if I leave this text box, let's leave it here, right, and I go into director mode, you can't tell that this is a text box, right? There's nothing in there to make me think that that's a text box. And so what I did was I changed the background color, right? I made it a nice sort of like transparent white so that they could see that that could be clicked into, okay? So that was important when setting up the text boxes. The other thing I did was I made sure that these elements, these text box elements could be interactable, right? Because if you saw, right, let's add in this one, right? Even if we added the background color, okay, we've got a nice text box here, right? I can't click on this. I can't edit it, whereas these I can, right? So in order to do that, Right, you're gonna scroll down into interaction and you're gonna check enable participant editing, right? That just allows participants to edit the content of the element, right? So now that this has been set here, if I go back into director mode, now I can type on this. Okay, so make sure when you use text boxes, whether they're inputting numbers, letters, whatever it is, right? Make sure that you make them identifiable, make sure that you change the background color, and again, make sure that you enable participant editing. Okay, so those are important things for text boxes. Next thing in this room is the arrow. So this is the first time that we're gonna get to see, um, we're gonna get to see the uh, visible for condition tool. Okay, so we're gonna scroll down. First of all, so this one is actually not a button, this one just links to the room, um, because this is, this is the one where they were like fixed set. So I, I knew that this group was gonna be going to Buzz's room number one. I put, you know, the this arrow in, um, in sitting room, room two, goes to Buzz's room two, right? So I knew that that was gonna happen. Um, and so I just linked these all out individually. But again, let's go down to conditions. So we have visible for condition. Let's open this up. 
So the condition builder is built almost exactly like the action builder, right? We've got these, like it looks almost exactly the same, right? With the first one, you're selecting element room user or tagged elements. The next one is the name of the room. The next one is what element. Um, so basically what this is, what this is asking is what needs to happen in order for this, this uh, arrow to show, right? So again, just like the condition builder, just, or sorry, just like the action builder, when you're thinking about doing a condition builder, right, you need to name your elements, right? You'll notice that each of these text boxes is named combo one, combo two, and so on and so forth, right? That is super important when doing your visible on condition because these are all named, right? These are identifiable in the drop down menu. So in order for them to get the arrow and be able to access the next room. Combo one has to equal this. Combo two has to equal this, right? And that's very simple. It's really just selecting equal and dropping in the text here. Right, and that's this. You'll notice that all of these are set to and and not or, right? And that is because they have to get the entire combination in order to in order for the arrow to appear, right? If they mess one up, let's say they, right, maybe put 11 there instead of 10, the arrow disappears, right? The visible for condition, the way that I set it up, the way that um, in theory you want it to be set up, right, is that um, they have to get the whole puzzle, right? All of these things have to happen in order for that to become, um, to become visible. And there are definitely cases where maybe you would do an and or logical chain, and we're gonna talk about that um, in a future room. So that is the first room of this experience. Okay, and now we've got the arrow, we've got the correct combination. Uh, let's go ahead and go to the second one. Okay, Buzz's tarantula is perfect for a booby trap, the text reads, uh, but where is the key to open the terrarium? Okay. So for this room in particular, I thought it was fun to do um, a sort of like hide and seek game, right? Buzz's room is very messy. These shelves are very messy. There's a lot of junk on here. And so I thought it would be fun uh, to basically have, have people move things around, right? You're sort of taking things off the shelves. You're trying to find the key to the terrarium. Um, this also, I'll just say, was very true to the movie, right? I was keeping in mind, I wanted people to still stay in this environment. It's very fun in an escape room whenever um, you really feel like you're in the experience, right? You're immersed in it. And in this scene in the movie, um, Kevin is like rummaging through all of this junk. He's like looking for things and the shelves end up collapsing, right? And what also, um, what happened, there is something else that happens in this room and you'll see that um, once we unlock, once we unlock the key. So for this room, um, you'll notice if you move your mouse over certain things, right, they become draggable, right? Your cursor changes. So I can actually move this out of the way. And I see that um, you know the key is not under there. Now, if I were a Photoshop wizard or if I had had more time to build this experience, um, which I did not at the time, I likely would have put this into Photoshop and I would have removed these, um, right? I would have like edited the photo um, to make the shelf look blank. Um, and so that would be something that would be really cool. That being said, if you're not a Photoshop wizard, you can still do something like this because I did and, um, and it still totally works. People had a lot of fun in this room. So I'm gonna pull all the draggable elements over here. Right, so let's keep looking. Okay, we've got something draggable here. We've got this trophy that's draggable, right? A bunch of different things that are just in here. Another board game up here, right? And as you mouse over, right, you'll see that the key is layered underneath this little box right here, right? So now I've got the key. Key's draggable. Okay, where is the key to open the terrarium? So you know that you are aiming to put this over here somewhere around this terrarium right so see people definitely like you know dragged it sort of towards the bottom i don't think the bottom um i i don't own a terrarium but i don't think the bottom is where you um would unlock a terrarium right i think it's somewhere close to the top so if we sort of drag this over okay so we have now unlocked the um we've now unlocked the terrarium um in the movie right if you remember from this scene when Kevin knocks over all of this stuff on the shelves, he actually unleashes the tarantula, right? Because the terrarium sort of like falls off the shelf and the tarantula gets out. And so I thought it would be fun to find a transparent gif of a tarantula and have it crawl across the screen in a sign that, you know, okay, the tarantula has been freed. Um, this was really exciting for people. They, they loved it. It was very, very much like a sort of surprise and delight type thing. Um, definitely whenever you're building escape rooms, right? I'm gonna go ahead and, and move this. 
but uh but but definitely whenever you're thinking about building escape rooms be playful with it right be be think of all of like really really use the platform and be creative think about the different sort of fun and surprising ways um that that you know you can entertain them during the escape room experience um so quickly just to sorry go back to this tarantula you'll notice that as the tarantula appears so does the arrow Right. And that's because the tarantula and the arrow are both set with the same visible for condition setting. And so I'm going to show you that now. OK, so these are all just draggable elements. Right. I just segmented the image. OK, so I segmented these different. Oops, this goes up here. Right. I just segmented them. And I just made them draggable. Right, I just set them right exactly where they go on top of the shelf. Right, the one thing that was important here was when I moved the key, right, that this was layered above the key. Okay, so remember, in order to bring elements forward and backwards, you just click on it, element bring to front. Right, so that's how you do that. Just make sure that that is, um, you know, that if you're going to hide something, right, make sure that it is layered underneath something. And then, like I said, the tarantula and the arrow both have the same visible for condition toggle. So let's open that up. Okay. And what I did here was, if you remember, in order to unlock this room, right, it just had to be that the key was at um, the right place on the terrarium, right? So what I did here is I tagged the key. Okay, that's my element here. And I used this, right, it, if you wanted it to be like very, very close, you could choose within five. I said within 25, right, of X, this, and Y, this, right? So how did I get those numbers, right? What I did, if you remember, if you've seen the part three training, you remember that we learned how to use the X, Y axis, right, and the width and the height of things. Okay, so if I move the key right here, right, you look, so on the XY axis, this is at 394 and 324, right? So when I opened this up, it's approximately, right, if you move it within 25 pixels, right, of the X and the Y, then that's where the key is going to appear, right? Width and height did not apply to this one. I wasn't changing the size of the key or anything. You can think about doing that, having people resize things, making them, you know, draggable, rotatable. Um, resizable. You can think about adjusting the width and the height and making them like contain something to a certain uh, size. But for this one, all it mattered, all that mattered was that the key was in the correct location, right? All that mattered was that the key was somewhere within 25 pixels of like this general area, right? And so that is how I built this. You'll notice also that this is a button, right? So all I did for this was I put the arrow as the text of the button so that that's how it showed up. The background color, the border is totally transparent. So, you know, like this, this is the same thing as this, right? The difference is I just took out the color, right? And I just uploaded, I, instead of the text here, I just uploaded that. I just dropped that in to this right here, right? So this is a breakout button and it just sends them users who clicked the button to the creepy basement, right? That's the next room. Again, if I were sending people to, um, you know, temporary rooms, I would just select this and do the exact same thing. Just send them to copy of this. Okay, and that is the Buzz's room experience, right? So sort of a game of hide and seek, just dragging and dropping things, moving things around, letting, um, sort of letting them all find it. One more note on this, um, since I am in the room by myself, you can't see my uh, my mouse cursor, right? Like the name that under peer, that appears under the mouse cursor. But in this room, I did have mouse cursors, mouse pointers turned on, right? So the way you do that is in the room settings, under interaction, you show mouse pointers and show the mouse pointers owner, right? What that did was it allows people to see who is looking where, Right. So it allows. So I'm saying like, oh, look, like I can I can see right if I'm in the room. Oh, look, like Lauren grabbed this bottle or. Oh, Andrew's grabbing this. Right. Like you can actually see um, sort of like where where your friends, where your fellow uh, game players are moving things around. And so I would definitely recommend having that on um, on really any interactive game where people are clicking on things together, um, but definitely in something like this. So with that being said, let's go ahead and go to the next room, which is the creepy basement.
Okay, um, so this one was sort of a Mad Libs inspired uh, room. And the way that I did this was I set up a, uh, a giant text box, right, with a, uh, a letter, and then I put in smaller text boxes in here, right? So the text up here says, you should leave a note behind so the cops know who you are. Fill it out before that scary furnace turns on, right? So again, so really staying um, on brand with the movie. Kevin is afraid of the basement. He's afraid of the furnace. Um, and then for this, this uh, sort of puzzle, it's really just Home Alone trivia. Right. It's really just them working together to figure out what they remember from the movie and what they may need to Google. There's definitely stuff within here that they needed to Google. Right. Because I highly doubt that anybody remembered um, some of this stuff. But some of them were sort of more fun um, and easy things that people definitely did remember from the film. Um, so the way that this worked. Right. Is that they would fill in these text boxes up here. Right. So you'll notice that um, I am capitalizing things. Right. And that's because in the condition builder, right, punctuation does matter. Spacing matters. Um, and so you do need to think about that. I think this room in general was very easy, um, you know, for, for them to get. It was it was fun. Um, you know, they, they really got it. But if I did have to make one comment on this room, it was to remind them to use punctuation. Right. For example, the pizza place that Kevin orders from is a place called Little Nero's. And I got a lot of this, right? And you'll see that does not have um, an apostrophe, right? But that needs to have one in order for the arrow to become visible, right? So there's a couple different ways that you can do this, okay? So for one, um, what I could have done, right, is I could have added a very, um, a very Kevin-like or Home Alone-like note here that maybe said, remember, you know, mom always says to use your punctuation or to capitalize your letters or to use your apostrophe, right? Something like that that would have clued them in without me having to tell them, right? Because the goal is that you don't have to help them. The goal is that they just get it. Um, they might stumble a little bit, but between all of them together, you know, they can they, they can figure it out. You don't want to have to be um, helping them, helping every team. That's not really a sustainable escape room and it's definitely not as much fun, right? So what I should have done in here is I should have had a... Um, I should have had some helper text that just said something like, you know, remember, mom always says to, you know, capitalize your letters, to use your punctuation. Um, alternatively, if you really wanted to be nice and you wanted to give them a lot of flexibility here, you could use um, an additional logic builder in the uh, visible for condition. So I'm going to show you what that looks like. Let's open up this arrow. Okay. So the way that this is set up is that they have to get all of these clues, right? Very similar to, um, you know, the combination lock in the sitting room where they had to get uh, the numbers, right? This text all has to equal this, right? And these are all set to and because you have to get, you know, 671 Lincoln and Wet Bandits and Kate and Peter and Frank and Toothbrush and Little Nero's in order for the arrow to become visible. Alternatively, what if I wanted to start a new logic chain, right? So here's what I could do. I'm going to add in a line item. I'm going to change this to or. And now there's a space right between once I click or there's a space between this logic chain and my next logic chain. So let's say I wanted to give people the opportunity to not capitalize anything. Right. I would go through. And I could do this. And so on and so forth. Right. Here's the problem with that. You're setting yourself up for an infinite amount of possibilities. Right. This would take you forever to build enough logic chains because you would have to consider the possibility that people might capitalize some things, but not capitalize the rest. Right. And so that's where you get pretty dicey. And so for something like this, I definitely recommend that you um, that you stick to one thing, right? Either have them use punctuation and tell them that it matters or tell them explicitly not to use punctuation, right? And in this case, I feel like it makes more sense to use punctuation by default, right? To capitalize everything, um, it, it's a lot easier um, rather than building logic chain on logic chain on logic chain, because like I said, there's just way too many possibilities for what people could put in here. And so in order to, you know, to make it the easiest, I think just keep it consistent and also just make sure that they know. Right. Make sure that they know what they have to do in order to get to the next part of the puzzle. Right. OK. Let's go on to the next room. OK, so text here says, hurry, you can hear one of them outside the door. Set up the trap to scare him off. Line it up perfectly. You want to be sure it goes through the doggy door. OK, so this was this was hard. 
Um, but I will say it's, it's hard because you have to sort of know what this scene in the movie is, what Kevin does in this scene in the movie in order to unlock this room, right? In order to get it right. I hoped that people would get it. And I will say in every single experience I ran of this escape room, there was at least one person in every room who remembered and knew this scene and knew what to look for. Okay. So in, so, so it did work, but it was risky. Um, and so, so in the, in the movie, what Kevin does is he hears the burglars outside of the door and he finds a pot and he, and some fireworks and he puts the fireworks in the pot, he sets them in front of the doggy door, he lights them up and it explodes, right? And it sounds like gunshots and it scares off the burglars. Okay, so immediately um, what you see in this room, right? Whenever you get in here is, is you see nothing, right? There's no text boxes to enter anything. There's no arrows, there's, you know, there's, there's nothing in here. You may not even be sure what you're looking for. So immediately what do people do? They start looking around, right? They start sort of like clicking. You'll notice, okay, look, my mouse becomes clickable in some places, right? So if I click around up here, right? My mouse is becoming visible. So if I click here, a pot appears next to where all these pots are hanging down here, right? And so, like I said, at least one person was always like, okay, we've got to get the pot. We've got to put it down here on the floor, right? They knew, right? And this text then helps you. Once you find the pot, you realize, oh, okay, I have to line up the pot with the doggy door, right? So it's on the floor. It's in front of there. And there's another clickable item over here. So here's the fireworks, right? These are draggable as well. So we drag the fireworks into the pot. Okay. Now that we've dragged the fireworks into the pot, this lighter has become available, right? You didn't miss that, it just wasn't there, right? If I move this over, right? Again, these are set up just like the key on the X, Y axis, right? So this, this lighter that was over here, it has a condition builder, it's visible for condition, is that the pot and these two fireworks, right, all three of these elements are set up exactly like this. Okay, so this took them a minute to get, they definitely had to like maneuver with it a little bit, but everybody got it, they, they totally understood. Um, so then the idea is, right, you take this over, you set off the fireworks, so kind of play with this over here, okay, so we got it and the gif of the, you know, the, the fireworks sort of go off, it explodes. And just like the tarantula and the arrow in Buzz's room in that puzzle, the explosion gif and the arrow here are set to the same visible for condition. Okay, so let's take a look at how this was built. I'm going to move all of this back. Okay, so first things first, right? These elements right here wanted to make sure that they were draggable. Okay, I had um, I had buttons to hide them. Okay, to hide the pot and to hide the fireworks. Okay, make sure that these are draggable. Right, you want to make sure that they are, um, you know, that people can play with them. Okay, so all of these are going to be draggable. Then you have the um, then you have the lighter, right? You also want that to be draggable. And when you open up the visible for condition, pretty lengthy here, but it's exactly again like the key, right? The pot has to be here, the fireworks have to be here, and the other fireworks has to be here, right? You'll notice that there are two options right? X, Y, X, Y, X, Y. Make sure that you fill all of them out. Again, the way that I did that was by dragging them to be approximately where I wanted them to be. Okay. And let's, for example, so let's just build this together. Let's delete. If we delete all of this, Right, let's start over here. So I've lined this up to be exactly where it needs to be. I'm gonna click on the lighter. I'm gonna open visible on condition. And if you remember from um, the part three training, you don't actually have to manually enter the numbers of the X, Y axis, right? If I select fireworks one, right? And I select X here, 
it auto populates that for me. Right, fireworks one. Now I'm gonna select Y. Got it. Fireworks two with an X, oops, Y here. These are just auto populating. Very, very, very simple. Pot. Done. Right? And then I just moved these back to where they were. How did I get the pot and the fireworks to become visible once, um, you know, once, once you sort of like moused over them and clicked here? I have action buttons. I have two action buttons. This one looks like it's off on that drawer. It's just because it's resized. So you'll see I, I held down D just like you can do that with participants, right? Just like you can, um, you know, edit participant windows to sort of shift them and move them around. You can do the same with any other element, right? So I just moved that to be sort of like, like it was clicking on this drawer. And this one I just made up here, right? So if you mouse over anywhere that's over the pots, right, this would appear. So let's open up that action button. All it does is it makes the pot visible. And for this one, it makes the fireworks visible. Right, so the goal here, right, let's hide these so we show them again, right, is if you mouse over, right, there's a button here. So you can't see anything because the button is transparent, it has no text on it, but there is clearly something to be clickable here as evidenced by the change in my cursor. Right, if you mouse over, there's clearly something to be clicked, and of course people click, and then it becomes visible. Right. So they line it up. And let's see here. Okay. One more note that I want to make about this room is that um, this room actually had music, right? And so I, it was the only room that I chose to use music for. I had just the, the Home Alone score playing in the background, um, but I did have the actual scene from the movie playing in this space uh, during, like, while people were in this room. And it ended up being really fun. Um, this this audio is from a movie that Kevin plays during this scene, uh, and it's how he scares off the burglars, right? And so just thinking of like those additional touches um, to sort of make, again, make your attendees feel immersed in the experience. Um, so we've definitely also used music in other ways, right? We've had people listen to music to as a clue, right, in the escape room. So you want to think about that, right, and um, maybe how that could be used to your advantage as well or like as a part of a puzzle. Um, I really only just used it in this room for fun. It, it wasn't like a clue or anything. Um, but then again, maybe for some people it was, right? Maybe they heard that music and they were reminded, they heard the scene and they were reminded of what happens here uh, because in the audio there is like a fireworks explosion, right? And so maybe that was helpful for some people in some way, um, but mostly it was was just meant to be to be another element of fun. Um, and with that said, let's go to the final room in this escape room experience. Okay, so the text says you did your best, but the burglars still made it inside the house. Help each other get to the treehouse to call the cops and get the hell out of here. Okay, so this experience was built with a certain number of people in mind, right? I knew that there were going to be six people on each team um, and I, I made the escape room to be like that, right? In general, I would say six is a pretty good number. I think anywhere between four and seven is a good number for each team whenever you're thinking about like breaking them out into their teams. Um, any less than that may be a little bit hard um, and any more than that, you know, it's sort of, it's not as fun because people don't get as much of an opportunity to really like play with the puzzles um, and really figure things out, right? So in this room, I built it so that, you know, it, it's really, you have to have six people in here, right? If you don't have six people in here, it won't work, okay? And so a couple of things on here, right? I put fake people in here so I could show you just for the purposes of this training. Um, you'll notice that all of these people are draggable. That's because, and I'll show you on the, you know, on the back end, um, I checked a button in interaction that um, by default, Participant bubbles in OEA are restricted to interaction by that user only, right? So I can only move me, you can only move you, and so on and so forth. Um, but in this experience, everybody could move each other, right? And that's because you're working together, right? So um, you're, you're trying to get right from this window to the treehouse in order to call the cops. Okay, 
So this was pretty clear, um, but I think it could have been clearer. What I did was, um, so the goal is right to arrange yourself in a line, right? So something like this. Okay. And I wanted this red dot to be an example of how the line should sort of go. Most people got it okay. I, I got a lot of like this at first, people tried to do like sort of on the line. So I would do something that maybe made that a little bit clearer. Um, but, but for the most part, this was totally fine. But you'll notice that I'm lining, I'm lining these up, nothing's happening, right? There's no arrow, nothing is appearing here, there's no phone, um, um, nothing's happening here. That's because um, these bubbles are set up to be arranged in a certain way, right? You have to be in a certain order. That is because if you remember earlier, whenever we were talking about the sort of Mad Libs, the trivia in, um, in the creepy basement room, right, where you could input all of the text, um, if I wanted to build a condition builder, right? So there, there is a phone, there's a telephone that appears here. And if I wanted to build uh, a condition builder on the phone, a visible for condition builder, uh, for all of the different ways that these participants could be arranged, it would take me it would take me a year, right? There's no way that I could possibly list out all of the different ways that these people could be arranged. That it's mathematically insane. So what I did was I made sure that they knew that they had to be arranged in a certain order, right? And you may not have even noticed it by then, but eventually someone did notice it, right? And what I'm talking about is the fact that we all have forced subtitles. Right. So if you come into this room, whether or not you had a subtitle before, you have one now. So I'm going to pull the notes and controls down so you can get a better look here. Right. There are subtitles. Right. I'm third. This person is second. This person is sixth. This person says leader fifth. And this person says caboose. Right. So eventually, after a couple of tries, maybe some frustration of them arranging themselves and not figuring it out, somebody realized that they have to be in a certain order. Right. This is why it's also helpful then to have them be able to move each other. Right. So then they realize, OK, this person's the leader. This person's the caboose. This person's actually already in a pretty good spot. The rest of us have to be in order. Right. So move second person here, third person here. We've got let's see. Oh, we may be missing someone here. Oh, or maybe, you know what, that is confusing. This should have something that says fourth. Because I just got confused on my own escape room. That's a lesson learned. So theoretically, right, um, this, and that also probably would have made it clearer also that this was a person who, um, this was a, you know, ha a person that was part of the chain, right? So let's see, still not getting it. There we go. Okay, so we have arranged ourselves in the correct order, right? Leader, second, third, fourth that wasn't clear, fifth, sixth, and caboose, right? And now we have the phone that is clickable in order to get to the end. So let's check out the condition builder on this one. Okay, pretty extensive. Definitely the most extensive condition builder so far. But really, it's just the exact same thing that we've been doing this entire time, right? So all of these people are named, right? Remember, we have got to, got to, got to name our um, our people, right? So they're all named. I even named this one, even though I didn't remember it. Okay. So they're all named so that in the Visible for Condition Builder, person one has to be within X, Y, like you know, within 25 pixels of here on the X, Y axis, person two here, and so on and so forth. So really all I did was arrange them in this order, open that up and just drop them in. X, Y, X, Y, X, Y, X, Y. And that was it. Oh, one quick thing I'm gonna show you how, just to make sure um, on these people, in order to get the subtitle override, that's right here in the name section of each participant, right? And then they are all draggable. And you'll notice that interactable only by self is unchecked, right? This, these elements are not interactive only or interactable only by the person who's occupying them. They're interactable by everyone. Okay. And that's it. So then you click on the telephone 
and you make it to the end, right? And so you did it, you defended your house and the wet bandits are in the slammer, congrats and keep the change a filthy animal, right? So again, try, sort of trying to stay on brand there with the experience and making sure that they know that they, they completed the goal that you set out for them at the beginning of the experience. Um, for this, I used a waiting list feature right? So click on the list below to mark your place in the rankings. This is really fun because um, this page, you'll notice the you made it page, there's only one of them, right? So all roads lead here. Every single to the treehouse page is linked to this one room, right? And so this is where everybody gathered at the end, they could see who else had finished, um, and then they could click to add their name, right? And a timestamp to, um, to this uh, sort of like ranking slot, right? And what this is here, is just a waiting list. So the way you get that is an element, insert element, that's a waiting list. And you just click to add your name, right? And you'll notice that with this one in particular, I clicked to show the time. You can also show the rank, right? I didn't show the rank because um, people were coming in teams. So it didn't really make sense because I didn't want, you know, people, two people in the same team to have different ranks. So instead it was just, um, you know, it was just the time that they, uh, the time that they took to complete it. So, you know, what time it was currently. And then sort of they had that, that leaderboard to check out as everybody came in. Um, so with that being said, that is, um, that, that's the gist of ideas for how to build an escape room, right? These are just a few things that you can do. We have done all sorts of things. We've done um, spot the difference games. We've done, like I mentioned earlier, games where you have to sort of like guess the music. Uh, we've put in sound effects, right? We made one once where you had to guess where the, a leaking sound was coming. We put an MP3 file of a, a sort of dripping water noise and they had to sort of look around the room and see where their cursor changed and see how to get it. We've had rooms where people have to translate uh, different, like, you know, different texts into different languages, convert letters into numbers um, and vice versa. We've had rooms where people have to arrange themselves in certain ways, where they have to make things certain sizes, all of those different things, right? And all of this is possible with the visible for condition, uh, you know, action builder uh, in, in, these, in each of these elements, right? This, with this tool, you can essentially do everything because what you're doing is you're unlocking something. You're saying it's only visible if this happens, right? And so that is the, you know, that's a huge way of how escape rooms are built. So again, just final tips, make sure that things are as clear as possible while still being logically challenging. Uh, definitely get people into your space to test it out. Feel free to reach out to us. We'd be happy to walk you through it. Um, and, and just constantly think of the different ways that you can use this platform, right? Scroll through the settings and check out all of the different things um, that can be accessed. Definitely try, uh, take, a, take a stab at building maybe some of the things that we've showed you in this training. Uh, and as always, please reach out to team at oea.co with any questions whatsoever. We are always here to support you and we can't wait to see the different escape room experiences that you build. Thanks everyone for joining. See you at the next one.